Hello everyone, welcome to Zeros TV. Today I'm joined by Gordon Johnson of GLJ Research. I don't hate Tesla, I just think Tesla's grossly overvalued and I think it's grossly misrepresented. There's literally 20s of cars coming that are gonna challenge Tesla. They're losing market share. This is a company that we think is on the downdrift. Let's look at the numbers. This isn't what I think, this is factual. Gordon, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. So we might as well get right into it. I know you wanna talk about the Fed, yeah. so What's going on? What are your thoughts? Yeah. Just give it to us straight. Yeah, so I just feel like when I look at the uh, talking heads on TV and the people they have on, uh, they give the Fed a massive pass. I think that the Fed that we currently have is the most reckless Fed we've ever seen. And, and I'm not just saying this. The, the way I calculate this is you look at the Fed funds rate minus CPI inflation. If you look at that simple calculation right now, it's the most negative we've ever seen, which means this is, quite frankly, the most reckless Fed we've ever had. Now, modern monetary theory, um, which dates back to 1990, has been a disaster for the majority of people in the world, you know, the, the non-rich, if you will. If you think about it, right, so Alan Greenspan, which started this MMT policy, which is basically the thought is that you don't need to worry about tax collections, you don't need to worry about anything other than printing money, and the jobs you create, the economic activity you create, will trickle down and benefit the rest of um, you know, the people in, in, in the economy. You look at the top 1%, the top 1%, 1990 to today, their wealth has grown from $4 trillion to roughly $48 trillion, 800% growth in wealth, 1990 to today. You look at the bottom 50%, their wealth has only grown 50%, from roughly $754 million to $3 trillion. So there's been a massive increase in the wealth uh, disparity gap where the rich have gotten six times richer due to MMT, due to things like QE, et cetera, versus the poor. And the 1% clearly aren't the bottom 50%. The 1% aren't the masses, so this has been a disaster. But you know, that's going back to 1990. Let's look at the current Fed. Current Fed, you know, Jerome Powell, you know, 2019, we had unemployment at a 50-year low. Unemployment at a 50-year low. Despite that fact, they cut rates three times. That goes completely against anything, right? You should be raising rates when the economy is good. They were cutting rates, so providing more accommodation. But the craziest part is what they've done recently, what they've done when COVID happened. Now, with the onset of COVID, right, we were looking into a black hole. We didn't know what was going to happen. So they did a massive amount of stimulus. They purchased more bonds in six months. Uh, than they did from the 2008 to 2019 timeframe. So six months in 2020, they purchased more bonds at roughly six trillion than they did over the entire 2009 to 2018 timeframe. Now, when they first started doing the stimulus, they did roughly uh, uh, two, two, two trillion in, in, in bond purchases. And that was understandable because we didn't know what COVID was gonna you know, look like. We didn't know how the economy was gonna be. Again, we were looking into a black hole. The problem is, if you look at retail sales, so retail sales, when COVID started, um, retail sales collapsed, right? But it took six months, not only for retail sales to get back to trend, but 15% above trend. Go back to the global financial crisis, 2008, it took retail sales six years to get back to trend. Go back to the uh, Great Depression, it took retail sales 10 years to get back to trend. So 10 years, six years, it makes sense to keep accommodating. But after six months, when we were 15% above trend, if the, if, the, if the situation changes, then you have to change your policy, right? They're supposed to be data dependent. Not only did they not change policy, but after we were 15% above trend at the end of 2020, when they should have stopped with all this stimulus, they did 852 billion of transfer payments, 550 million roughly of which, uh, billion of which, I'm sorry, um, happened post being back to trend. And I think this is the reason why, you know, you've had this, gross inflation, and I think it has, you know, real consequences, which we can talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we'll get to, you know, maybe how they'll respond to inflation. You know, I think what's interesting, as you mentioned, is when Powell admitted that they crossed a lot of red lines with their pandemic response. Right, right. Um, you know, is there something that the Fed can do to get this genie back in the bottle? Uh, you know, the, the Fed's certainly been talking tough about taming inflation and, and 50 bips hikes at uh, several meetings. Um, what do you see for their path forward, given what they've been saying? Right, that, that's a good question. So let's go back to what Volcker did, right? So in the late 70s and early 80s, inflation got out of control. And I, I, you know, Volcker was a hero. He, he saved, I think he saved the economic system. But I don't want to give him too much credit initially because 
If you look at what happened in the 70s, bank rates, like for instance, you, you look at the 30-year fixed mortgage, right? It's sitting at 5.35%. It may have even went up 10 basis points. I don't know. It's, it's skyrocketed. You know, you're talking about uh, a 30-year fixed mortgage rate that was roughly 3% a year ago, right? But the 10-year is sitting at 2.8%. My point is, what happened in the 70s was the Fed was doing something similar. They were saying, hey, don't worry. We're going to keep rates low. You know, we don't want to raise rates. Don't worry. We know what we're doing. And you know what the bank said? They said, yeah, right. So what they did is they started charging higher rates for the things that you know, they sell to you and me, mortgages, loans, et cetera. Point is, the banks are now saying, we're leaving the Fed. And what happened, I want to bring that back to Volcker. What happened was you know, real rates, bank rates, you know, corporate bond rates, mortgage rates, went to like 12%, 13%. And Volcker was still sitting on a Fed fund rate of around four to five percent. So what did he do? He did about he did like an 800 basis point hike in one fell swoop. So when you talk about a 50 basis point hike with CPI inflation just under nine percent, I mean I know people are saying yeah th you know they're being aggressive, but to your question, what do they need to do? They need to bring the Fed funds rate up to where CPI inflation is. And a lot of people were saying that will create a recession. But maybe a recession is necessary. Economic cycles are necessary. And what this Federal Reserve and prior Federal Reserve governments have done is they've basically circumvented economic, uh, you know, economic cycles. And whenever we went into a downturn, they stepped in and basically pushed it out, kicked the can down the road. But again, what, what, what that's caused is you, you print all this money to do that, it creates massive inflation. You know, for instance, home prices right now, they're sitting out on average I don't even know what the today's number is because the numbers came out today up 20% today. Home prices are sitting on average at a $511,000 right now. Last year, $408,000. You look at the 30-year fixed rate, 5.35% right now. Last year, 3%. Run that through your mortgage calculator, you're talking about a mortgage rate on average, $1.6,000 last year. Now it's like $2.6,000 for an average mortgage. Yeah, you know, it, it's funny because, you know, from a macro perspective, the home builder situation is just one that fascinates me because you know we hear a lot about the tight supply, mm -hmm. uh, but if you look at units under construction versus uh, completions, there's just this massive gap. You right. know, and you're talking about the surge in prices, the surge in rates. Meanwhile, we have what looks like a potential surge in completions. Right. You know, so is it truly going to be as tight of a market as people believe, or is you know are we looking at almost like another perfect storm for the housing market? And if you look at the over the past, you know, 100 years, the biggest hits to our economy have come from, you know, bubbles. You talk about, uh, you know, the, the, right before the Great Depression, the bubble before, you know, the, the, the 1929 bubble that caused the 1930 collapse, um, you know, the housing bubble that caused the global financial crisis, and now what I think is an everything bubble. You know, you're talking about market cap to GDP right now, the highest we've ever seen. You're talking about participation in the stock market, the highest we've ever seen. You're talking about, you know, Dogecoin, which was created as a joke. Literally, this is not a joke. It was created as a joke that's sitting at a $20 billion market cap. It was created as a joke. You're talking about everything you can spell being NFT'd and being sold. So the, the idea that we're not in a bubble, I think, is laughable. And I think people need to start asking them hard questions because the damage that they're doing um, is, is currently killing the masses. But I think the results of these bubbles popping um, are going to be catastrophic. I don't think we're looking just at a housing bubble. I think we're looking at a stock bubble. I think we're looking at a, a, a Bitcoin bubble. I think we're looking at an NFT bubble. So the amount of wealth that's going to be um, decimated as a result of this, I think, is scary. And I think we need to get serious about it. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, to your point about, you know, doing damage to the masses, you know, one of the data points I've been looking at is um, real disposable income. Mm -hmm. And shockingly, you know, when I first saw it, I couldn't believe it. I had to rerun it again. Um, I think the latest print was negative nine or negative 10% year over year. Right. You know, so if we're, we are looking at wages adjusted for inflation. I mean, it, it, it goes to your point that it, there's, there's a lot of damage being done, done here. Right, and you know, is inflation really running at CPI inflation at 8.9%? I don't know, you know, the apartment we're in in, in, in New York uh, let's just say six months before we moved in, the percent increase was almost 100%, almost 100%. Um, and since we've moved in, we've been in the apartment, and this is just me, I mean, we've been in the apartment for, I think, like eight months, and already since we've been in, that same apartment is up 30% in cost. Look, Charlie Munger, who, whether you love him or hate him, he's been successful investing. Uh, he went on CNBC recently and, and a number of other channels, and he said, the only thing worse than, 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 than inflation is, is a nuclear war. 
Inflation is a very serious subject. You can argue it's the way democracies die. So it's a huge danger once you've got a populace that learns it can vote itself money. If you look at the Roman Republic, they inflated the currency steadily for hundreds of years, and eventually the whole damn Roman Empire collapsed. So it's the biggest long-range danger we have, probably, apart from nuclear war. The safe assumption for an investor is that over the next 100 years, the currency is going to zero. That's my working hypothesis. If you study the Weimar Republic, what happened was they effectively got rid of shorting and um, they implemented a basically um, mechanism like we have now where it's just perpetual printing. Uh, you had uh, you know, hyperinflation, social unrest in the streets, um, and it gave rise to you know, an autocrat like Hitler. It, it, and Charlie Munger made that point. He said, you know, inflation um, kills you know, empires, be it the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, Weimar Republic, a number of places in, in, in Africa, Venezuela most recently. Um, and it seems like the Fed is not doing what's necessary. Think about this, right? Since the end of QE March 9th, their balance sheet is actually up $45 billion, right? All this jawboning this year, we have CPI at nearly 9%, and they've only risen their Fed funds rate 25 basis points. You're talking about from zero up 25 basis points, and yet inflation's running at 8.9. Their, their rate should be matching inflation at the very least, if not above it. So they're not serious about fighting inflation. Yeah, and I mean, not even throughout history, but you know, I, I've seen several stories recently about riots in Peru and Sri Lanka and, and even Shanghai with right. the, the food shortages and, and price increases. So, yeah, I, you know, I, another thing I want to touch on, you know, you did mention before that, you know, does it take jacking up rates and, and potentially throwing us into a recession? Right. Uh, what's fascinating to me is there are some market indicators, obviously the yield curve being one of them, that seems to be warning of a potential recession in, let's say, the next 12 to 18 months. Right. Um, you know, you look at things like real disposable income and you see how household finances are being squeezed by inflation. Do you see, you know, if the Fed, say, gets two, 250 basis point hikes off in the next couple of months, do you see a recession in the U.S. at such a low rate, or do you think it will take something much higher? I think that growth is slowing. I can't call when we're going to be in recession. I don't think anybody can, but I think it's inevitable because I think that what's happened is there should have been a recession with COVID, and we pushed that out. Um, there was a massive misallocation of money with the PPP program. You know, again, retail sales were back above trend six months six months after the onset of COVID, yet. You know, we did the initial, I think it was 1.6 trillion of fiscal stimulus, not even Fed monetary stimulus. And then they did like another, I think like two to three trillion. Um, and, and by the way, build back better, they were trying to do even more. So the answer to everything is just to throw money on it, throw, throw money at it, but that is not the answer. Um, so I don't know when we're gonna be in recession. I think that given that inflation is now a problem, I think that more spending is not gonna be the answer. So I think we're gonna have to go into a period of negative growth. I think the more important thing is, um, you know, the dollar's reserve currency status. And, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, on top of the four trillion in debt or on balance sheet, I'm sorry, the Fed already had, they added another six trillion, right, um, just throughout the COVID uh, 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 process and the recent stimulus process. And the problem is, assuming the 10-year normalizes at 4.9 percent, which a lot of um, uh, analysts and economists are calling for. Um, if the Fed doesn't bring this balance sheet down, 30% of the income will go just to rolling over existing debt in the U.S. And if that happens, I believe that, you know, the dollar could be close to losing its reserve currency status. And that scenario, I think that, you know, the people, you know, chaos on the streets and, and um, you know, social unrest, I think, does become a problem. So I think it's important for the Fed to bring down its balance sheet. I think that's what um, is important for them to do. Well, for anyone that wants to see just how serious this is, I mean, just pull up a chart of the two-year yield, right? I mean, if you think about having to roll over debt, as you're talking about, uh, which most of it issued during COVID was at the front end of the curve, um, you know, you're talking about virtually no rate to, you know, two, three percent on the two-year recently. So all that government debt's going to have to be refinanced at, you know, two, three times the rate. So, yeah, I mean, it could really have some serious ramifications, but you know, 
going back to the yield curve really quickly, um, you know, it did briefly invert when the Fed made their first rate hike of 25 basis points. Um, but, you know, are we looking at a situation where as the Fed continues to tighten, we're just going to see a deeply inverted yield curve? Uh, I know some of the members have talked about the potential to run active QT to re-steepen the curve by selling the long end. What are your thoughts on that? Because, you know, I think there's, there's serious liquidity issues associ associated with that plan. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, it, that, that's a great question. So the, the inverted yield curve was something that was important. But as you noted, and it's, it's interesting you note this because I've seen it uh, incorrectly stated so many times, the bulk of the purchases they did were below 10 year, right, uh, during, during COVID. The, the treasuries they were buying were very short, short and dated. So when they stopped that, it, it, was, it was our viewpoint at GLJ research that the, the two year was going to go up much quicker than the longer dated bonds. So, but, but to your question, I, I don't know exactly what they're going to do. I, I, don't, I don't know exactly how it's going to play out, but I think what's most important, and, and, and again, I, I think that so many money managers and so many quote unquote smart guys out there, we haven't seen inflation like this since the 70s, right? We haven't seen inflation like this since the, you know, basically in 40 years. So I think what's important to look at is what actual real, what we, we call real, real market rates do. Like, you know, what people are charging for mortgages, what corporate debt is being issued at, et cetera. And I think that that is going to actually lead um, what the Fed has to do, no matter what their plans are. For instance, again, the, the company I'm referencing, Sunrun, which is a company I cover, you know, the, them issuing ABS paper at 2.75%, you know, in December, and now the A1 tranche being five, meaning, you know, the Bs are probably going to be at a 150 spread, meaning the actual cost of that debt's going to be 6%. That's a massive increase in the cost of debt, right? 30-year fixed mortgage rates going from three to five, almost five and a half today, massive increase in debt. So I think those real market rates are going to keep going up. And I think that's what's going to force the Fed to really act because even the, the you know, the white knight, the, the, the great Volcker, that's what forced him to act. Right. Yeah. You know, I, one thing I did hear the Fed talk about recently, and I can't remember which member it was, but they did mention a, a reverse twist operation where effectively <laughs> they would be selling the back end of the curve and buying the front end to try to re-steepen the yield curve. Right. Uh, there are obviously concerns about bank health with, with an inverted curve. To me, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like taking such an action of trying to purposely steep in the back end of the curve right. that could potentially impact market rates such as mortgages, uh, car loans, things of that nature yeah. would just be absolutely disastrous for the economy. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree, but you know, it's, you mentioned this uh, when we were talking earlier, you know, Dudley, um, he said that, uh, I think in his write-up, he said, you know, the market has to crash. They've kicked the can down the road with respect to economic cycles playing out. You know, recessions are healthy because it gets rid of things that shouldn't be in the market, companies that shouldn't be operational, you know, excesses that shouldn't be there. And what they've done with all this stimulus, not just the Fed, but also the government with the fiscal. By the way, I think a lot of the fiscal has been driven by this idea. You know, when the Fed did QE, when Obama, you know, the, the first time they did it was Obama, this experiment, if you will, the idea was it's going to create inflation. And everybody got the, the comfort, unsubstantiated comfort, that, oh, it's not in cre creating inflation. It did. We saw inflation in stocks. We saw inflation in homes. But you didn't see inflation in food and clothes and you know, stuff normal people buy. So I think that gave the government the impetus to do all this fiscal stimulus. So um, uh, to your point, I think that they, they need now for a real cycle to play out. I think they need a recession. And you know, the Fed can control the demand side, right? You raise rates, that reduces the amount of debt that's in the market. Uh, you stop basically expanding your balance sheet or throwing money into the market every day, right? They were doing 40 billion of MBS purchases you know, as recently as, you know, a few months ago when, you know, we had a shortage of homes. This was nuts. This was crazy. This is why housing prices exploded, right? Buying uh, 80 billion of treasuries at the same time. So you stop doing all that um, and, and you reduce your balance sheet and, and you force, you, you can affect the demand side. I don't think they can affect the, the supply side. So I think they actually need a recession. So I know that sounds crazy what they're proposing, but I think it's uh, a necessary evil, if you will. Well, speaking of recessions and getting rid of excesses, um, let's talk about the short side, which is what we love here at Zeros TV. <laughs> um, you know, let's let's start with with the favorite, right? Let's start with Tesla. Right. Um, can this macroeconomic impact, you know, situation impact Tesla? But more broadly, just what's your outlook for the company? You yeah. know, whether that's changed with Elon Musk buying Twitter or whatever outside forces yeah. there are. Look. It, Elon Musk buying Twitter is just kind of a, a sideshow, if you will. 
Um, I would say this, you know, over the years, one of the key arguments for Tesla has been, you know, just buy the stock because he's going to save the world and, you know, he's going to use this money to take us to Mars and or, you know, build more electric cars, which are great for the environment, which they're not. But um, what a lot of people say when we get on TV is they say, Gordon, you know, you've been wrong. You've been wrong for two years. Um, and I want to push back on that a little bit because outside of the bubble stock price, what have we been wrong about? Let, let me explain. Uh, Tesla's market share, global market share of autos right now, is basically 1.2%. That's their global auto market share. Um, and yet, at 1.2% market share, Tesla, at its current market cap, is valued at nearly every single auto company combined. They're valued at more than every single auto company combined, yet they have 1% market share. Now, let me explain. In Q1, their unit growth was flat, right? If they're valued at more than everybody combined, their unit growth should be 100, 200% every quarter. In 2Q, we believe their unit growth is going to be negative. Why? Because their Shanghai factory has been shut down. Now, you can argue, okay, their capacity is constrained, they can't control that. But when you put a factory in China um, and you rely on China, you deal with the you know, negative consequences. So you look at that dynamic. You look at the fact that, you know, well, people say it's not a car company. 95% of their revenues in Q1 were from selling cars. 95% of their revenues in 2021 came from selling cars. The other 5% came from an energy division, which in Q1 had a negative gross margin. That means before SGA, before all those other costs, it's losing money. This is a car company. It's not a technology company. Um, you look at their full self-drive. It does not exist. They're selling a product that does not exist. It's hard for people to grasp that because they've been doing it for roughly you know, eight years, but there is no such thing as full self-drive. Driver assist technology, Navigant ranks them dead last. I would you know, tell your viewers to go on TV, you don't have to take my word for it, go on YouTube, type in Tesla full self drive or Tesla autonomous, and look at their cars wrecking into curves and, and driving into on car. It's, it's just so, they, and, and on the battery side, they don't make their own batteries. They buy batteries from CATL, Panasonic, um, and LG, um, despite the fact that some people think they make their batteries. They don't lead in any technology. They have 1.2% market share. Their growth on a sequential basis quarterly has stopped. Um, and, and now the CEO is, uh, you know, getting into Twitter. I would argue that outside of the bubble stock price, the bears have not been wrong, right? We argued that FSD was, you know, um, not what they said it was. I think we've been proven right. We argued that, you know, they're losing share. Their market share in China has fallen from roughly 23% to 13%. Their market share in Europe has fallen from 33% to 16%. Um, so when you introduce competition, they're losing market share. BYD now outsells them in EVs in China. They sell more EVs in Tesla in China by a factor of like three times. VW now outsells them in the EU, and we believe when as Ford ramps up, they'll probably outsell them in the U.S. They're just not investing in new cars. I think that this is a bubble stock that I think is going to burst, and I think when it does, it's going to be catastrophic. And I think that people not doing the real work on this company and continuing to spout these, you know, three to five year out projections from Elon Musk that he doesn't seem to ever hit a lot of them, um, I think is gonna cause a lot of people a lot of pain. So I think Tesla is gonna be the greatest short of all time. Uh, we've been wrong on the stock price, but I think when uh, the story is told, you know, five to 10 years from now, uh, I think that, uh, you know, I think we're gonna be proven uh, quite, quite correct. So, uh, you know, that's our view on Tesla. Yeah, there's, there's no question. Timing bubble stocks is <laughs> is nearly impossible because it's 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 a cult following that you need to, you know, when does the belief run out, right? Right. Um, but going back to the fundamentals, as you mentioned, right. what is your take on their latest quarter? Because I know I saw a couple of different takes on online. Yeah. You know, how did they met? You know, uh, unit volume was flat. Um, you know, sale price was slightly up, but magically, um, operating right. expenses fell and, and so their, their margins ballooned. Right. Uh, yeah, I've seen fraud thrown out left and right. Yeah, I, I but, but what's your take on that? We, we, we don't want to use that word. <laughs> but here's what I'll say. Um, so in the quarter, um, four days before the quarter ended, NHTSA basically changed rules around CAFE uh, requirements in the U.S. and that provided Tesla a 288 million windfall of 100% gross margin revenue, pure margin revenue. That is not Organic, Tesla said it was one time. Clearly, none of my peers talked about that. Nobody on TV talked about that. You also consider that their operating costs were down significantly in the quarter in the hundreds of millions, despite the fact that we have 40-year high inflation, all their contracts renewed at the beginning of the year, right? That's one cue. 
uh, and they're ramping two new factories. How is that possible? I, I don't know. Uh, we caught it magical in our note. Uh, we would love to talk to the company and understand they don't answer our questions. Um, and then in addition to that, if you look at their other non-current uh, assets, which essentially are government subsidies, uh, another 100% um, gross margin uh, a form of revenue, which, by the way, is not, not, not core to their operation. It, it doesn't come with selling cars. It's not core to their operations. That was up significantly. So we believe of the $2.76 they reported, roughly $1 of that, $1 of that was non-core. Um, so you think about that. You also consider uh, the fact that their deliveries were flat essentially in Q1, despite the fact, again, they're only 1%, 1 point, roughly 2% of global auto sales, yet they're valued at everybody else combined. That is a huge red flag. I mean, the fact that they're not growing sequentially, despite this, you know, they're, they're valued at 100 times earnings um, when they're not growing, despite the fact that the rest of the auto industry is valued at six times. I mean, you would think in a normal environment that would be catastrophic for the stock, right? And then in addition to that, right, the day before uh, Tesla reported earnings, Netflix went X growth, meaning their growth declined. Stock got crushed, right, down, what was it, 30%, uh, 25%? I, I don't remember exactly. So I believe in 2Q, Tesla will go X growth. Their units will decline sequentially for the first time since, uh, I think it's 3Q19. But then Elon Musk got on the call and said, no, we're going to grow. And look, he says a lot of things. And you know, I just, I, I think, and this is our opinion, I think that's just patently false. I think that there's no way they're going to make up the growth they lost in Shanghai. I think their units will be down in Q2. And I think when that happens, the stock is going to come under tremendous pressure. Listen. You talk to any Tesla owner, one of my friends owns a Tesla, and he, he's, he's part of the quote-unquote cult. He loves it. But he's had issues with his car, and he's had service problems, right? You see this mentioned many times. There's service issues with Tesla's cars. They haven't had a new model in how many years, right? They promised the Cybertruck, all the, you know, the, the Tesla Semi, all these things, um, you know, the Roadster, um, the $25,000 Tesla. None of this stuff has come to bear. But instead of investing $45 billion in Tesla to fix the service, to come with new models, he's investing it in Twitter. I think that, that speaks volumes. Who knows, maybe with the Fed starting to tighten liquidity conditions, then the, then the bubble activity in the stock might finally come under and people might start looking at the fundamentals, who knows? Um, I think the answer is yes, we'll, we'll, we'll see, we'll see. Turning to you know another topic, I know before we were discussing another area that you've, you've done a lot of work on, it's really concerning, especially as we come into earnings season. Right. Can you elaborate on what exactly you're looking at as it pertains to the solar industry? Yeah, that's a great question. So as you know, um, the solar industry has come under some pressure recently. Uh, there's a macro component in our view and there's a micro component. Uh, so let's focus on the, the, the macro. I think two key things uh, from a macro perspective. Number one, um, Chinese solar panels back in the Obama administration, panels made in China were hit with you know, um, uh, uh, very aggressive tariffs. You know, some were hit with anywhere from 70% to like 120% tariffs, meaning you ship a panel in from China, you're literally having to pay the government more than the price you're selling at. So clearly it's, it, it doesn't, doesn't make sense. So what did the Chinese module manufacturers do years ago? They effectively stopped shipping directly in from China. What they would do is they would make the cells in China, ship them to Taiwan, Malaysia, uh, Vietnam, et cetera, make them into panel, uh, modules, and then ship them into the U.S. So they would circumvent the tariffs by basically shipping into other countries. And for years, you know, people like myself and others argued, you know, they're doing this, and the government didn't care. There was an anti-circumvention case that everybody thought was possible to happen. Uh, the, the, the Biden administration initially announced they were going to investigate it. Then they announced they weren't, and everybody thought they weren't. We had done a lot of checks that suggest they were going to do it, but everybody said we were wrong. But then, lo and behold, they did it. So... A few months ago, Biden announced, okay, we're going to investigate this. Here's the problem. The way it works is right when Biden announced that, if indeed they come up with you know, 50, 70, 80, 90% tariffs, those tariffs are retroactive back to when the case was announced. So what's happened is the Chinese module manufacturers have said, that's too much risk, right? If you're, if you're Jinko Solar, right, that case was announced two months ago and you continue shipping panels into the US and then it comes out you get hit with 120% tariff. Not only did you just lose all that money, but you owe the US government money. Um, so all of a sudden, Chinese panel manufacturers said, we're not shipping anything into the US until we get resolution on this. Re resolution we are expecting on uh, August 29th of this year. So what's that mean? Well, we said it meant guys like Nextera who are doing utility scale solar projects that have Chinese panels, right? Chinese panels are roughly 80% of the panels that are installed in the US. Guys like Sunrun, Sonova, um, who do uh, resi rooftop um, installs, 
Guys like Sun, uh, uh, Solar Edge and Enphase, they sell inverters, but if there's no panels, you're not going to need inverters, right? If you don't have the panels, you're not going to have the system. So, so all of these guys, we believe, we said we're going to have to cut guidance. And nobody cared. And then what happened? Two weeks ago, we were talking about this, Nextera comes out and says, we're pushing out two gigawatts of demand to 2023, right? Stock got decimated. The entire solar space got decimated, rightfully so. Um, so to your point, as we enter earnings season, we have in phase tonight. Um, I think that maybe the Q1 results are good for some people, maybe they're not. But I think the guidance is going to disappoint. And in a market where we were talking about this liquidity, right? Global liquidity, as measured by Bloomberg, has dropped nearly three trillion dollars over the past uh, uh, basically month. Um, now, with liquidity leaving the market, all of a sudden people are going to look for companies that actually make money, companies that actually are sustainable, not just growth companies. So if these companies come out and disappoint on earnings and or guide to weak numbers and negative cash flow, I think the stocks are going to get hit. And we think that's going to be a theme throughout solar over earnings season. So I think the other issue is you have an energy crisis, right? I mean, so right now in, in, in Europe, and I would argue this summer in the U.S., due to the Ukraine war and the lack of <coughs> stable energy supply, um, you have energy prices in Europe skyrocketing. They've been doing that for a while. Why? Well, Europe made a bet years ago that solar and wind are good for humanity, right? So what did they do? They decommissioned nuclear facilities. They shut down coal plants. They got rid of natural gas plants. These are all distributed baseload forms of power, right? You get it whether at night or day, right? If, if, if you wake up in the middle of the night, you want to go get that sandwich in the refrigerator, the natural gas provides you that power. They got rid of that stuff. They replaced it with solar and wind. The problem is solar and wind are unreliable intermittent peak load, meaning when the sun's not shining or the wind's not blowing, you don't have any power. So what happened? They effectively became reliant on Russian gas, right? Because the solar isn't a real answer. So they could virtue signal, hey, look, we're reducing our carbon emissions, but they were buying that stuff in Russia, you know, and, and, and so they became reliant on, on Russia. The problem is, uh, from a macro perspective, they need real answers, right, right now, because energy costs have skyrocketed, people can't afford it. You can't just continue doing solar because it doesn't work. So I think that what they're going to have to do is they're going to have to go back towards, you know, coal, nuclear, distributed baseload power, power forms. And I think that that is going to render demand for solar weaker than what I think a lot of people expect. When this first happened, right, when the Russian war first happened, a lot of solar bulls came out and said, this is great. This means they're going to do more solar. But solar doesn't work. You understand the reason why they're in the situation they're in is because they've done so much solar and wind. So if they want real solutions, it's not about what they want. They need, they have to have real solutions. They're going to have to move away from solar. So I think there's a disappointment coming in Europe in the back half of this year with respect to solar installations. And I think that's going to be um, uh, prevalent in guys who have big exposure to Europe, like you know, the Jinko Solars, the Solar Edges, uh, the SMAs, et cetera, of the world. And we're going to see that in earnings season. Well, if, if you need any anecdotal evidence, you know, I, I have noticed my latest trips to the Home Depot. Uh, I haven't seen the Sunrun guy harassing <laughs> me anymore as I walk down the aisle. So, that's funny. Um, no, I think that that's, that's really fascinating because, um, you know, for a while there, it looked like the natural gas price spike, the oil uh, price spike, things of that nature were being focused more in Europe, right? They were supposedly more impacted by the Russia-Ukraine crisis. Um, but just as you know, recently as a week or two ago, um, U.S. natural gas prices have just gone absolutely through the roof. Right. So um, yeah, I, I totally get your point on that, that we could be looking at a, a real severe situation, which piled on top of the already inflationary yeah. environment, real disposable incomes, um, could, could bring about a nasty environment. So. I mean, one thing, the U.S., right? So when Biden got in office, right, go back to when he was first campaigning, he said that if these guys, he said, they were talking about putting oil companies and uh, CEOs in jail, putting them in jail, right? And, you know, then when, then when oil prices went up, he said, well, listen, there's all these permits out there. Why aren't you guys drilling, right? It's like, well, we don't want to go to jail, you know? It's like, you know, when he got in office, you know, he restricted drilling on public lands. Uh, there were threats to put oil CEOs in jail. And like, even though oil prices went up, these guys are like, you know, you talk about drilling a new well, that's like a three to four year investment until you start actually making money. So these guys are like, we're not gonna start drilling until you give us some, some guarantees. And I think the problem is, I think this is gonna be a pro become a big problem this summer. Oil demand is highest in the summer, right? People are driving around. Natural gas, probably highest in the summer, air conditioning is being turned on. So I think this is going to be a crisis also in the U.S. And I think as the crisis unfolds, it's going to be hard to push 
for more support for solar when we've already done that and this is the situation we kind of find ourselves in. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, so it's, it's funny because, you know, when I was looking back right before the election of what potential plays had come out, regardless of who won the election, you know, what were the big plays that you could right. make on a macro scale? One of the things I noticed is, you know, under the Obama administration, they had some of the same desires towards the energy industry, but energy sector did very well during his, his time in office. When Trump came into office, you know, you look at, he was more favorable towards the drilling activity, and energy stocks just did terribly. Right. Um, and then, so it's, you know, Biden comes back in the office and <laughs> they're through the roof again. So, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, I think uh, you've made some really great points here today. Um, I found it really fascinating between the liquidity and some of these bubble stocks. I know solar has been right up there with a lot of the ESG uh, interest. Um, but I'd love to just thank you for, for being here today yeah. and uh, hopefully we can do it again soon. Absolutely.